Look, over one million of you nutters watched the original video, so you're just gonna have to accept that the sequel is coming your way to ever-diminishing returns. That's how this works, you know. What usually doesn't work, notice the flawless segue, is when tag team partners just cannot get along in real life. Usually able to work through the tension for only so long, things very often come to a head, leading to major heat, bad breakups, and sometimes physical altercations. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 more pro wrestling tag teams that hated each other in real life. Tom Campbell, I despise you. Join us. Number 10, The Young Stallions. If you look up good-looking white meat babyface 80s tag team in the dictionary, you will likely find a picture of The Young Stallions. Paul Romer and Jim Powers were two prelim guys who were put together at the behest of Pat Patterson and went from staring at the ceiling and opening matches to feuding with the Hart Foundation. Their push began to fizzle out as their real-life relationship broke down, unfortunately, with both men contending that they were two very different people from different backgrounds and didn't get along away from the squared circle. Powers complained that Roma was more concerned with money and his position on the card, while he was just happy to be there because he loved the business. The two got into a big bust-up one time over a miscommunication regarding a flight, which resulted in Roma turning up late to a show and getting fined for it after waiting for Powers, who had already been there an hour by the time he arrived. Roma soon ended up telling Patterson that he no longer wanted to be a stallion, and so Pat took him behind the stables and shot him in the head. Well, actually, he started teaming with Hercules instead, but why argue over semantics? Number 9. Arn Anderson and Paul Roma Back with Paul Roma again, but moving on from him slapping hands with a hot little twink to sitting under the learning tree of a bloke who was born a 46-year-old with a beer gut. Roma showed up in WCW as a surprise new addition to the legendary Four Horsemen group, a late replacement for Tully Blanchard after negotiations between Tully and company fell apart. Fans and wrestlers alike generally agree that Roma was one of, if not the, least deserving member of the Horsemen ever, a sentiment that was shared by AA. Arn was not happy with his inclusion in the group and didn't enjoy teaming with him one bit, feeling that he was a step below what was required and didn't have the tools to become the credible player that WCW envisioned. Roma, for his part, would later say that Anderson was simply jealous of his physique, likening Arn to the Pillsbury Doughboy and claiming that the whole concept of the Horseman was just a giant ego trip for its aging members. Number 8. William Regal and Tajiri William Regal and Tajiri originally formed an alliance while going against THE Alliance in 2001, with the Japanese buzzsaw acting as the then-general manager's assistant. They reunited in early 2005 after Regal's regular partner Eugene went down with an injury, and they won the world tag titles on Raw from the land of the rising sun. Though they had a decent 86-day run with the straps, their styles complementing each other nicely in the ring, things were not all well behind the scenes, or, in fact, in the car. The gentleman villain has spoken, perhaps with his tongue planted slightly in his cheek a bit like this list entry, about how he hated travelling and interacting with Tajiri. According to Regal, when the two would ride together, the Mist Blaster would insist that they drove in silence, claiming to be afraid of music and had other quirks that got on the Englishman's nerves. Tajiri's main phobia was spam meat, which Regal delighted in torturing him with by eating it and pulling ribs like hiding the stuff in his partner gear bag. Having to put up with Tajiri's odd habits ended up driving Regal slightly bonkers, and he was relieved when they eventually lost the titles and disbanded as a unit. Or at least, so he says. He loves him, doesn't he? Number 7. Fire and Ice Scott Norton brought the fire, and Ice Train, well, he brought the ice, naturally. Despite only being together for a grand total of 13 matches, Fire and Ice had some belting outings with the Steiner brothers and looked like they could become a dominant force in the tag division before they hastily broke up. Last year, Ice outlined the reasons why the duo weren't a more long-term proposition, saying that he and Norton clashed backstage because neither one of them wanted to be in a tag team to begin with. Even though they were both strong, barrel-chested hard lads, they had very different personalities that did not 
gel well. Norton once said it was a battle just to get out of the locker room and to the ring for their matches, while Ice estimated that they didn't talk for more than an hour total the whole time they were together. Ice did express regret at not making more of the situation and getting to know Norton better, believing they could have been something truly special if they had put more effort in. Number 6. La Resistance for La Resistance, it was very much a case of too much too soon when it came to their almost instant WWE success. The team won the World Tag Team titles a month after their televised in-ring debut and were then put into a program with the Dudley Boys. Rene Dupree was young, at that point the youngest person to win a championship belt in company history until they put one on an actual child, but he was the second generation son of a wrestler and promoter and grew up in the business. By the time he made it to the main roster, he was practically a veteran, while Sylvain Grognier had no background in the business and was greener than Kermit's asshole. This contrast led to some backstage bickering and situations that got the team a lot of heat with some of the other boys in the back. Sly later said that though he could handle himself in wrestling, Dupree was ill-equipped for the real world and didn't appreciate having to babysit his partner. Both men were happy when Dupree went solo and Rob Conway became Sylvester's full-time partner. Happily though, the French Canadians patched things up in later years. Number 5. The Blade Runners They became certifiable megastars later in their careers, but their earlier days teaming up as the Blade Runners, or Power Team USA, or the Freedom Fighters, Sting and the Ultimate Warrior were young, clueless, and paying some serious dues as they tried to make sense out of the alien to them wrestling business. They possessed great physiques and showed flashes of charisma, but they were raw and a bit too rough in the ring, making it hard for them to find steady work, let alone get a decent push. Bonded by their rookie struggles and endeavouring to do everything together in order to survive, Jim and Steve were close friends at the beginning. Their relationship deteriorated when they began working for Bill Watts's Mid-South Territory, with Warrior feeling as though Sting didn't back him up and let others influence him, forcing them to drift apart. Sting, for his part, says that he always felt that Warrior was a different breed of cat and intensely paranoid. Warrior, in his late later years would often trash talk his former partner, while Sting would take the high road and wish Hellwig well. Go figure. Number 4. Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder Alright, obviously Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder are legit BFFs IRL, I think that's how the kids say it, but when they first met each other way back in the day, there was genuine ill feeling between the two. Their paths crossed at the very beginning of their careers as they were both training at the same New York wrestling school. As Ryder tells it, there was instant dislike initially due to their competitive natures. The problem was that the two looked similar, were the same age, had the same body type and had the same passion for wrestling. They didn't click until someone suggested, gee, you know what? Maybe putting two guys who have the same look and body type and are the same age and have similar interests in a team is the way to go. Neither one wanted to be in the team, so things were frosty in the beginning, but eventually thawed as they bonded over their love of the business and action figures. They remain very close to this day, despite a professional pact to focus mainly on their singles careers going forward. Number 3. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner there are plenty of reasons why friends and tag partners fall out, but a competitive rivalry based on muscle-building capabilities is one of the strangest and most decidedly pro-wrestling ones. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner began teaming up together when both were members of the NWO Elite in early 1999. They only tagged for a few matches, but they were a constant and consistently entertaining presence on television, usually in backstage segments or in-ring promos. Both men took their physiques seriously and trained hard to get the best body in the business. But whose was the best? That was the question that the rest of the potster is in the locker room kept asking, winding up the big bad booty daddy, who was already tiring of Buff's personality, particularly his meticulous grooming habits and penchant for talking, mostly bollocks, all of the time. When the team split up at the behest of Freakzilla, he subsequently went out and cut a shoot promo on the stuff, making fun of him for his stripping past. When the two finally met in the ring, Scott gobbled him up and left a few markings on Buff Daddy's face as a way of telling him how he really felt. Number 2. The Blackhearts 
The Blackhearts were basically formed on a whim, with a pre-gangrel David Heath and fellow struggler Tom Nash driving from Miami, Florida to Calgary, Canada to work for Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling. Apocalypse and Destruction were supposedly the bastard sons of Stu Hart, a rib played by Stu's son and Stampede Booker Bruce, and had a decent run in the territory before moving on to other places, including all Japan. While touring the land of the rising sun, Nash managed to rub some of the veterans on the tour, including Stan Hansen, the wrong way. His irritating personality got him an in-ring hiding from the Lariat and put an end to the Blackhearts working for Giant Barbar for the time being, which upset Heath. What really complicated things, however, was Heath starting a relationship with Nash's then-wife, Luna Vachon. When Nash, who suspected the affair, caught them in the act, a fight ensued which was won by Heath and pretty much ended their time as a team, with Nash drafting in another wrestler, Dave Johnson, to work as Blackheart Devastation in Heath's place. Place. Number 1. Axel and Ian Rotten Brian Axel Rotten Knighton trained John Ian Rotten Williams in the early 90s, breaking him into the business and allowing him to work as his kayfabe brother as the two did the indie thing as sibling tag team The Bad Breed. Their greatest success came in ECW during the mid-90s, though they are better known for their matches as opponents rather than teammates. The Rottens lost a losing team must split up match to the Pitbulls in early 95 and then spent the next several months knocking the stuffing out of one another in a variety of brutal stipulation bouts, including the infamous Taipei Deathmatch, where both men had shards of glass superglued to their fists. Though they worked together in a professional capacity, it's said at this time that the two were no longer close and didn't want to team together due to various behind-the-scenes issues. They reunited in later years, mostly in Ian's IWA Mid-South promotion, but there was clearly still animosity there, and in a 2010 shoot interview, Axel referred to his former partner as everything wrong with the wrestling business. Fortunately, the two did manage to make amends before Axel sadly passed away in 2014.